but I'm going to keep it short so that, you know, uh, I can probably reach the right information to all of you. Uh, oh, and uh, sorry if I interrupt you, but I have a surprise for you. Oh. Uh, look who is joining us just for now. Hi. Our dear friend, Mai. Hello, Mai. Oh, hi, Mai. That's a surprise. I was not sure that she could make it. Oh, me. Me, right? Me. Yeah, it's pronounced me, actually. Me. Me, right? Yeah. Me. Oh. oh, my goodness. I cannot believe this. Thank you so much. You took time out. <laughs> That's oh, yeah, great. Of course. I'm super excited. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I just, yeah, I just happened to put a few information together and was hoping that it will help somebody somewhere in some parts of the world. And it's a nice platform to exchange thoughts and ideas. So thank you for coming here, me. Yeah, of course. <laughs> All right. So hi, let me me. how are you? Thank you very much well. for joining us today. Yeah, and hi everyone on the that I uh, have not met yet. Um, yeah, um, Eloisa reached out and invo invited me to join this call. So um, I was previously with Scratch for the past five years, uh, and now I'm at an organization called Digital Promise. But I'm still super uh, excited about you know like all the ideas uh, uh, that are within the community. So excited about learning more. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Just, just for, you know, uh, here today we have people from many countries. Uh, first, LCL friends and people that we met around the world. We have Roberto from Switzerland, Adele from Tunisia, and that's from uh, Sweden and Kira and Veronica that you may know, Veronica from Mexico, mm -hmm. so, and Mohan and I. <laughs> so I think you, you, you have already met the most of us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you for everybody for coming and it's an honor for me uh, to present in front of all of you, especially that all of you are educators, professors and teachers and you know, doing research in your respective fields. I understand the uh, area is quite diverse, but I'm just trying to present a few of my little experiences that I try to pursue side by side with other work. Uh, and I'm just going to give a little bits and pieces of information in terms of informal education that I experienced traveling to different parts of the world. And uh, some about computer science technology that I experienced as a student that other peers of mine experienced. Uh, as I told you, I have never been a professor in college or university. So um, most of my information has been gathered either through my personal experience, interacting with kids from different parts of the world or uh, from uh, my uh, you know, fellow colleagues and peers who are professors, who are peers, and I have tried to take a survey, uh, you know, understanding what they have to say about education in different parts, mainly including India and Canada and parts of US that I traveled. So I'll, not, I'll try to keep it short. Um, so, yeah. So just uh, in case you don't know uh, my background a little bit, and the reason I'm telling about background is because it's important, uh, especially uh, to understand the source of information where I'm getting all this from. So I was born and brought up in India, and I lived in the United States for four years. Uh, and then moved to Canada recently, like last year, 2018, uh, as an immigrant. Um, I studied computer science and engineering in a university in India. And after that, uh, worked full time um, in information technology, data science. That's my most, uh, you know, covered area, mainly business intelligence. Uh, if you don't know what it is, it involves data analysis, creating visualizations uh, to help inform business decisions. Uh, so that's my primary profession that I'm in. Uh, while on a side, I always try to pursue my interest in you know, helping community, especially in education and learning sciences. Um, now, why did I uh, start working this way? Uh, so just to give you an understanding. Um, uh, in India, uh, I'll just talk a little bit about how it is like in India. Um, 
So uh, in India, what happens is um, mostly from like, you know, there's a lot of competition because uh, there is competition everywhere, no doubt, but uh, every student, uh, no matter from what background they are, they try to give their best in schools and mainly because of the scarcity of jobs and they always try to put their best foot forward. And usually parents from you know, a middle class family or from a very uh, common family would always expect their kids uh, to, you know, be either an engineer an engineer or a doctor or something that kind of a profession which will give them a stable job that's what they expect so accordingly i was also told from childhood okay you become either an engineer or doctor and i ended up becoming an engineer i didn't know much at the time what it meant and what computer science meant but uh, as i was studying in college in my third year of camp uh, like in campus selection when i got a job uh, then i decided like okay now i'm free to do what i like and I thought like education was something where I definitely have to play a role in because one is I love teaching and second thing is um, I observed my kids uh, sorry my siblings uh, they were not that interested in studies uh, especially with the uh, traditional system instruction based where uh, you know a lot of priority was given to grades and uh, sometimes they started losing interest in uh, you know the way the instruction was given in schools they wanted to pursue other interests uh, so then i thought like uh, okay how can i be a little creative in uh, introducing new things in education and do some experiments with it but then at the time i didn't have much opportunity so i started with volunteering in a school uh, that was within my campus I will get into that in details. So I started volunteering and teaching math in my, in a school in India for five seven you know, like in the for grades five to seven between two thousand six and thirteen. Two thousand six is when I was in third year college, and two thousand seven was my last year in college. So at that time, the fourth year, I started teaching them. Uh, after that, I continued with my job full time, and on the evening or weekends, I used to teach kids. Then uh, in 2013, I moved to the US uh, and I worked in the Kid Museum as a maker educator, where I started teaching as a volunteer initially, but then, uh, you know, maker movement was a big thing at the time. And th that was something I found great interest in because I always wanted to do something creative in education and learning sciences. So I joined that team and I'll get into those details how. Uh, then I worked there for four years I had an opportunity to collaborate with Harvard Graduate School of Education, the Scratch Foundation, and thanks to me because she helped me connect with other people, uh, including people from Kid Museum to initiate a Scratch It Meetup uh, in February 2017. I don't know how far that's going now, but uh, definitely it opened doors for more education and collaboration with uh, amongst this wonderful, you know, learning centers and institutes. Uh, then that was a way for me to give back to the society all that I earned from them uh, slowly over time. Then I did some independent research uh, in the middle when I had to leave US due to visa reasons. And that was when my husband and I were decided, okay, we have to solve this. And uh, be, depending on a visa, which is like, you know, it may or may not work every year. Uh, we have to think of something better. So that's where we moved to India, uh, spent some time with family, took a break for six months or a little more than that. And then in that year, I started doing some survey research with uh, kids uh, from different parts of uh, India, from Bengal, where I am from, from other states, uh, Pune and Hyderabad. And then I tried to collect the data and present my observations in the form of a poster session. I'll come to that in details later. Then I worked as a behavior interventionist in Canada when I came as an immigrant, worked with autistic children. Uh, that was my way of exploring another spectrum of kids who were sometimes advanced learners, but probably they were not that great in communicating or they had other challenges. Finally, last year, I was present with an opportunity by MIT Media Lab to work as a facilitator and a community moderator for learning, creative learning. And I don't need to uh, introduce that to you because all of you know that because you were from there. 
uh, eventually. So that's uh, in brief my journey. And I will touch a few points in respect to my journey and then I'll come back to the questions that Adele especially asked about computer science education in India versus Canada and other places. So <clears throat> these are some of the places um, I happen to visit in connection with education. And uh, just in case you know where India is, this is my home country. Uh, this is, uh, okay, these are the parts that I have been to uh, in connection, <laughs> in connection with, thank you, Eliza. <laughs> yeah, I was a little <laughs> nervous, but anyway. And uh, so, uh, these are the parts that I happen to visit and uh, mostly in connection with children, computing and education. Um, I'll get into those one by one. Uh, so to talk about India, right, again, I'm just magnifying the map a little bit. Uh, here are the metropolitan cities. If you see New Delhi is the capital, Mumbai, Chennai and Kolkata. So I belong to this uh, uh, place. Sorry, sorry. Uh, I, I, um, I don't know why I don't see the map. I only see the first slide. I don't know for oh. the others. Oh, could you refresh or maybe your session has timed out? I don't know. Uh, is this added? Yes. Uh, like the places that I got to visit in connection with education. Uh, so sorry, hello. So initially I didn't know it would be just focused around India. So I just tried to bring tidbits of different experiences uh, that I had in other parts as well. Uh, maybe that will help you all connect uh, to the education system in different parts of the world that I happened to visit. So uh, I studied, now coming back to India where I belong. So I hope you all can see now. Uh, these are the metropolitan cities like New Delhi is the capital, Mumbai, Chennai, and Kolkata is where I am from. So it's the eastern part of India. Uh, I started in a school called San Xavier's High, and um, that was based in a small harbor very close to Kolkata. Uh, at that time, uh, I was very lucky to get a lot of great teachers in the school who, uh, you know, uh, it was instruction-based traditional teaching system at the time, but... Um, you know, the mode of delivery, the way they taught was uh, something I was really lucky to have. Mm, I will come back to computer science. So uh, how I ended up studying computer science. So computer science, I studied in BTEC in college as, um, uh, you know, for engineering. Uh, it was between 2003 and 2007. Mm. In school at that time, when I was studying computer engineering, uh, I had no exposure to programming. Uh, and that's what I uh, sometimes tell people, even in one of the interview with me, I told that. So the first exposure I had to computer science as a student was in the engineering college where I happened to see the Turbo C editor, that blue screen. And, you know, some of the professors, they were able to explain the concept somewhere not. We were scared. Most of the students, we were scared to see the error messages. Uh, we didn't know that it's okay to make mistakes you know, in computer science, and then we could actually, you know, fix the issues. That's called debugging. That's what we learned later on. So I was initially scared, like, okay, I'm always able to, you know, do solve math problem. Why am I not able to solve this? This was something really scary I found. But then I talked to other peers, other friends. My husband, he was also a computer engineer. So he told me that in his schools and in a lot of other schools, they happen to have, uh, you know, studied uh, computer in high school level. Uh, they studied C, C um, basically C++, which was object-oriented programming. Uh, so some of them learned Pascal or BASIC as a programming language in early childhood. Uh, not everybody had a computer at home back then. Even now when I'm doing a survey, I'm learning that not everybody has a computer at home unless they're a computer science student. So one of the reason was people couldn't afford um, but now it's pretty common. Uh, it's getting more common. So uh, in college, we were first exposed to programming. So when later on I got to learn Scratch and other programming languages, I found, uh, wow, through visual programming, you know, the concepts can be made so clear, especially with the loops, the structure, the logic. 
which uh, fundamentally remains common, but keeps growing as you get into the intense programming languages. So that was my idea of studies computer science. I will get into other things too. One thing I can tell for sure is in India, uh, the knowledge base is given a lot of importance. We have a lot of things in the curriculum. Uh, but uh, what I experienced uh, when working in the West is here, hands-on stuff are given a lot more importance. And that, that is something I really appreciate. So <clears throat> when I studied, uh, now I'm focusing again on my BTEC course, because as I mentioned in 2006, uh, I started uh, looking for an opportunity, like after I got the on-job, uh, like uh, on-campus job recruitment, I thought like, okay, why not start volunteering? So this is my college campus. Uh, it's Heritage Institute of Technology. Uh, if you see, there are different buildings inside. Uh, there is a very popular school inside called Heritage School. And uh, in 2006 itself, they introduced an evening school in the campus where um, you know children will be learning um, about primary education they will have elementary school level studies but these are uh, the children who are not so privileged uh, they are coming from economically backward society and uh, many of them couldn't afford to go to day school so uh, some of them had to take care of siblings at home or maybe they didn't have parents they were not so privileged as us so my timing would only match in the evening because daytime I had to do the classes in the campus. So in the evening, I used to stay back and teach them all subjects at elementary level uh, and then go back home. So that was my routine. And I thank uh, everybody there for giving me that opportunity to volunteer because I learned in this way about one part of the society uh, who are not so privileged as us. Uh, one of the reasons they came to attend those school was the amount of milk and snacks they were provided, you know, free of cost um, in the evening. That That's pretty sad, but that's one of the reasons they came. And then they started finding more interest in studies and continuing to learn more and more. This is a glimpse of the, you know, children that study in the Surya Kiran school that I used to teach. Uh, they have indoor activities, outdoor activities for students. They have writing, drawing sessions. Prayer service is one of the important things because that's how through meditation we used to, you know, assemble them together, help them learn discipline because their background was so diverse that they didn't have a proper, you know, upbringing or maybe parents to take care of them at home. Excuse so, me, Mohana. Uh, may I ask you something? Uh, just to understand it. This is a, a school uh, provided and everything is provided by the government. It's a public school. How is, does it work? Because okay. here we have many mm -hmm. kind of stuff, but we don't have this kind of public school here. That's Okay, yeah. So, so, uh, so let, sure, I will tell you. So if I go back to the slide, uh, that's a very good question, Heloisa, thanks. Uh, so this is a school that was initiated by uh, an NGO, a uh, non-government organization called Kalyan Bharti Trust. Uh, so under the ages of Kalyan Bharti Trust, uh, they accumulated fund to kind of sponsor the school in the evening. Mm, so the Heritage School, which was a day school, that was meant for, you know, people from the uh, well-to-do families from affluent backgrounds who could afford and that had pretty uh, lot of amenities in the school facilities like uh, you know swimming pool gym uh, playground for kids computers lots of things were there for their activities but during the evening uh, this school was run by the trust called Kalyan Bharti Trust who actually bared all the cost okay Thank you. And does, uh, do you have any other uh, schools like that in, around India or in this so, region of India? How is that? Sure. Is this so, is an exception. Just sure. Yeah, there's an exception. So in India, like there are government schools, there are public schools, just like in US and Canada and other parts. Uh, there are private schools also. Uh, which are, you know, they, people have to pay a little more to go to those schools. But unlike uh, here or in other parts, uh, like uh, I will get into that comparative study, like how it is there versus here. Uh, 
so some are sponsored by government, they're public schools, they're relatively subsidized and people can afford to go to those schools. They're private schools also for people who want to learn extra, you know, it depends on families like what you would prefer. There are good schools from both the areas like government as well as uh, like public as well as private. And there are also NGOs uh, who try to do a lot of work like this, especially where they find that, for example, these kids, right, they had no uh, no uh, support from family at all. So government, when they did not take care of these kinds of kids, then somebody had to, you know, come forward. So a lot of NGOs, uh, sometimes people try to do out of, you know, care and self-love and all that. Um, they try to bring people together to raise funds. I'll talk about another school like this. And this was uh, one of the, uh, you know, few that was sponsored by the trust. And so that's how it worked. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And for public and private schools, they have a fixed curriculum, a syllabus is what we call. So uh, no matter what be the school, public or private, they have a board, uh, central boards examination that everybody has to go through. Uh, so that, uh, you know, kind of um, in every grade, so people know that, okay, they are passing all the subjects with uh, proper marks and then they are passing the school final and like that. However, in these kinds of schools, which are a little informal education, they are, uh, we don't have enough structure, but that's kind of dependent on, you know, the authority, like who wants to run it, how they want to define it and how they want to collaborate, uh, you know, talking to other schools and uh, other universities. Okay. So the, uh, after I uh, taught there for a year or so in Kalyan, in uh, that school called Surya Kiran, um, uh, my um, kind of term <laughs> closed because I was no more a student in school, in the university, sorry. And then I uh, eventually joined a job called Tech Mahindra, which was, uh, which based me in Kolkata. So I was lucky enough to continue my work. Uh, so there was another school founded by We Care Foundation and I'll tell you the history of it. So this We Care Foundation, they are like, there is a, a, a person, a, a very nice lady who was in our community. She uh, was, uh, you know, a homemaker initially. Uh, her husband was a doctor. So she found some of the kids uh, in the area, local area, you know, uh, going around the house. They were like, you know, playing all day, not going to school. You can see they're uh, plucking fruits from trees. You know, they had no um, exposure to studies. So what this wonderful lady did was she, um, you know, found, uh, she registered a school in their name, uh, but not that uh, quick. So what she did was first she invited these kids in a, um, you know, in their house because they had a lot of space in the house and then I started telling them stories uh, and I and some of my friends we joined that so there were two clubs if you see here one is called Mojaru that's a fun club uh, and there is another parallel school called Notunpat I used to teach in Notunpat as well as I was a part of the fun club Mojaru where we used to gather the students you know make them sit in a circle and they would listen to stories from nice novels, interesting literature subjects, and then they would be taught, uh, you know, in a playful manner, they were taught how to do dance, drama, and through those, uh, you know, atmosphere uh, came up new, new methods to learn. That's how we were experimenting and they enjoyed it. And then they were giving snacks sometimes, so they would come. So from two people, three people came, more four people came like that. It started growing into a batch of almost 30, but that happened very eventually, like slowly and steadily. Uh, then what happened was, um, and I will share all these slides with you, so don't worry. And there is a website associated with all of them. Like here you can see wecare.sdf. Uh, that was again a website. Uh, my husband and I, we built it for them. <laughs> It was a very informal one, so they didn't have much, you know, amenities to, to be provided initially. Um, and so same goes for Surya Kiran also, there's a website you can check. Uh, so this is the map of Kolkata, just to give you an idea where it is. And uh, in these two clubs, we used to teach them mathematics in grade five to seven. They didn't have any exposure to computer at all. So one day we, I brought a laptop and showed them, okay, this is how it works. They were super excited. And you know, they started coming, learning more. And that's how it grew. 
And it started with a batch of two, and I'll get back to that. So these are the two kids who were in the first batch. They actually happened to pass the school final in 2018 that is last year. And they came out with flying colors. Um, one of the sad part is like, even though we registered the school, like this is the address you can find, but you know, uh, due to a lot of political reasons in Bengal, uh, these kinds of experimental schools couldn't last long in the sense like after say primary education or elementary school, they couldn't extend it to a high school standard or, you know, furthermore. And uh, many of the kids like, they, since they had other responsibilities at home, some of them dropped out. Uh, but um, this association, they helped, uh, they tried a lot to keep them together. And so in this case, as I was telling, they were, uh, you know, eventually Sangeeta and Shampa, they were shifted to other school in the primary school level so that they could get into mainstream education and then eventually continue their studies up to the 10th grade. And they finally passed the school final. So that was kind of a milestone for the school. And now it still continues, but in small scale in primary levels. Um, and they are enjoying, the kids are enjoying their studies there. <laughs> and uh, the funding that you were talking about. So this We Care Foundation used to get fund randomly from you know, different places. There was no fixed funding as such. And sometimes like um, the auntie that we were talking about, she and I and we always, try to you know make sure like we talk to the people we try to approach people for funding take help from government but you know uh, it's very unfortunate uh, especially the part that i am from um, it's not uh, like the politically the place is not that active as compared to other states in india that they will you know uh, move towards growth and development and progress I will tell about other parts of India as well, where people are dealing with Lego, we do, and you know, Lego bricks, and they are trying to learn new stuff, creative learning, education, maker spaces are being built. Uh, schools are collaborating with Media Lab. Uh, even last year, when I tried to go to Bengal to my state and try to talk to the missionaries and, you know, mm, uh, see what I can do, uh, people said that don't try to do anything. There was a, a wonderful blind school you know, meant for some children who couldn't see. But again, due to lack of funding, they all stopped. Uh, even the good schools that I knew about in Haldia and other places, eventually they're dying down because of, you know, um, lack of maintenance. Some Again, another thing is due to political reasons, uh, ch uh, mostly the students of our batch and next batch, they're heading out of the state to different parts of the country and the world where the opportunity lies. So that's how the city is kind of dying down. So now uh, towards the end of 2013, when I got uh, like uh, an opportunity to visit US, um, I was based in Maryland here. Um, and uh, as I told you, like I, I still had that fire <laughs> within me to kind of, you know, continue looking for opportunities to uh, implement creative learning and, you know, advancement in education. Uh, because uh, in India, what I saw is uh, children faced a lot of, uh, you know, um, pressure in studies sometimes because of grades, because of always having attention to secure good marks, go to the best universities, otherwise, uh, if you are not doing exceptionally well, you are nowhere in the society. So there was always a struggle because, because in US and other parts, what I saw is everybody has a space. Like suppose if you want to do well in science, uh, in arts, uh, in music, in drama or in sports activity, you still have a path to, you know, kind of go smoothly. Mm, but uh, in our um, country, the number of electives are a little less. Uh, so a lot of, uh, you know, um, importance is given to science and math and some special subjects. So it may differ from place to place because the 26 states and six union territories, they are not the same as um, everywhere, like the administration differs. But yeah, more or less, the story is pretty same. So I wanted to bring some joy to children's life and studies so that's where when i moved to 
Uh, yes. I'm sorry, I'm so curious. I have so many questions. Uh, yeah. Just before moving to the United States, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, in India, they, you said about the, the, the struggle that is to, to go on and to, to the uh, high school and college. So, uh, how is it in India? The best universities are private or public how does it work uh i'll i'll get to that there's another slide for that later on okay i'm going to that okay so, okay sure so uh, right now i'm just I'm sorry <clears throat> i'm just summarizing my journey in brief uh, touching different places to talk about the informal education informal okay. education I mean, not the mainstream school, and then I'll go to the mainstream school, college, universities, and uh, okay. give you a gener generic picture about the whole stuff. Okay, and there it. is also a, and there is a wonderful comment I actually got to ca collect from one of the teachers who was teaching in India. And now she's teaching in Edmonton, Alberta. So she, I just took her, uh, you know, small interview to understand what she thinks studies would be like. So I have that comment written for you. <laughs> so that should help. Yeah, and that actually answers your public and private, that difference thing, yeah. So now in the United States, just the places I visited, I have circled here. Um, there is not much to explain, you know a lot about it. Uh, so at that time, maker movement was given a lot of importance. Uh, so I, have, I knew nothing about US and uh, I didn't have an opportunity to do a master's also, I was just, hanging around, uh, trying to explore the country, know the people, the culture. So in that process, I um, got along with a few people, did some volunteering in the New York Maker Fair, uh, and then again came back to Washington DC in the Silver Spring Mini Maker Fair. I volunteered helping kids learn about making, about science. This is a, a wind tube that was uh, constructed by one of our creative directors from Kid Museum called Michael Smith Welch. Mm, then here is the welding area you can see like soldering, children are learning how to do soldering. Mm, then they're, they're in this <laughs> small tiny, uh, you know, screenshot you can see Mitch Resnick there in the New York Mako Fair. Uh, so that, that was the first time I met him and he actually, you know, connected me to other parts of um, other uh, interesting people from DC area. That's how I came to discover Kid Museum. Um, so, uh, in the uh, after the you know, all these uh, volunteering activities, I got connected with a few people in DC, as I was telling, and they started working in STEM in science, technology, engineering, art, and math. Uh, and they were making a, a kid museum that was a new kind of a maker space altogether. Mm, so I was volunteering there, eventually became a maker educator. And this is my a small glimpse of the workplace that I used to be at, Legal and General America. So when I was talking about business intelligence, visual, um, you know, visualizations, dashboards that would help business decisions, this kinds of work I used to do in the day. And around the clock, I used to rush <laughs> to the kid museum, uh, help with the makerspace setup. So this was DC's map, like I used to travel all the way to north and then south and back and that's what I would do, but I enjoyed my work throughout. And that's the only way I could take time out because in US, you know, if you don't work on a visa, <laughs> either you are studying on a student visa or you are working, right? So I wasn't studying at the time. So I was working and I found time uh, out for myself to volunteer and do all that I wanted to do. Mm, this is a glimpse of the maker educator um, uh, sorry, of the, of the Kid Museum, where I worked as a maker educator uh, between 2013 and 2017. Mm, uh, these are tidbits of the pictures. If you see, there's a flying drone within the maker space, which is being built. That was <laughs> the first year uh, we were, uh, so Michael Smith Welch, myself and Michael Cubs and Cara Lesser, the founder and uh, of CEO of Kid Museum. We were trying to help build the maker space. Uh, there are draw boards, if you see, that you must be acquainted with. Uh, there are, you know, with cardboards, people would make all these wonderful <laughs> places like a small house for kids. Uh, there were uh, some of the workshops that I designed where we, we played around and experimented. Like with vegetable blocks, I, I was showing them how to make fabric block print. 
then there was a windmill that was driven by Lego Vidu and Scratch. Uh, so these are small tidbits of, um, you know, the experiences I had in the museum. Uh, and through this work, I not only had an opportunity to, you know, design workshops for children in informal education setup, uh, but also had the opportunity to, you know, go out to outreach activities, you know, held in other public places like libraries, like schools, even in shopping malls, stadiums, because at that time it was a museum without walls. So we were like reaching out to people, telling them what's going on, what's new, and you can come and visit us and learn something. And uh, unlike in India, where I happen to work with children who were not so privileged, and not economically um, doing well. Here, uh, the kids and their parents, I found they were spending extra time after work, after school, to kind of help children learn all this new stuff about creative learning and experiment and science and technology. So, uh, and one of the good things I found in US is there is no limitation of resources. So if you want, you can buy stuff, you can, get funding and you can do work, whatever you want. So kids uh, thoroughly enjoy their studies, their learning in this playful way, you know. Uh, and one of the thing I want to really appreciate about US is no matter how much hard efforts I put or everybody put in the process, everybody had a place, a recognition uh, of the work, the talent, everything. And you can see like Kid Museum had the opportunity to visit White House. So that's where I happen to, you know, have a pres uh, an opportunity to present my work in front of uh, Megan Smith, the Chief Technology Officer of the United States. Then uh, Tina Chen, who was at the time the um, assistant to the staff and, you know, uh, sorry, she was um, Chief of Staff to the First Lady and the President. Uh, Mr. Barack Obama. Mm. Here is our team who visited the White House. Uh, it was an hour of code event uh, where we were inviting some of the local kids to kind of come and participate. They were just taught a line of code. Uh, even the president did a line of coding in the morning uh, in a brief visit. And we all kind of presented our work. Some of them worked in robotics, some of them worked in, uh, you know, scratch, um, in other areas of you know, innovative studies. Mm. So these are some of my projects that I personally happen to build and uh, a glimpse of it, if you want to see, it's in this website uh, that I again handcrafted and uh, it's not that so professional, but anyway, you can get an idea of what it is. So uh, just to give you an idea of the flow, uh, I experimented with the electronics and tried to see how I can embed that into say LED embedded slippers or say a lantern or, you know, making some design out of it. So the same thing could be used in different ways or maybe the draw bots sometimes hand crafted, sometimes connected to the Lego we do kits and, you know, trying to uh, see how it works. I can show you a small video that as uh, two small videos I just captured if you have some time uh, to see how this computational you know, projects were built. Um, so let me just quickly pull it up, it's there. Mm. So one is a theremin, um, if you see, uh, it's, um, it's something I did in my own personal makerspace. So here, if you, this is, there's an ice block uh, and there are electronic circuits, uh, you can see, um, which, are, which are like connected to a breadboard. And this whole connectivity is being made through human hands. You know, so the uh, when you are touching the ice and you're touching the piece of metal on the other hand, the circuit is being built through you and that's how the sound is coming. So it has been programmed. Then there is another I wanted to just quickly show. This was on scratch. So, it, Sorry, on a scratch day, uh, this was a small code that I wrote to kind of help people know how we can connect uh, programming to the physical world using Lego we do. So mm, we built uh, in the maker space in Kid Museum uh, a handmade uh, you know, wooden piece 
uh, to kind of uh, have some strings on it. And there is a windmill that I'm going to run to kind of brush uh, against the strings of the instrument to play a sound. So, Yeah, so a few glimpses of the projects um, that we try to build. Now, um, then I realized eventually while designing the workshops that, uh, you know, knowledge is, knowledge has to keep growing. You know, you have to learn from more other sources, talk to people and understand what's going on around in the world. Uh, me, uh, she was very, uh, you know, she was a very nice friend of mine. Eventually, she came to know me through Scratch and these activities. She told me, why don't you go attend this uh, coding summit? Like, uh, there, there was a wonderful summit a conference, uh, you know, organized by MIT Media Lab at Cleveland, Ohio, where they were uh, with, I think, Progressive Art Alliance, uh, which was a collaborative effort to, you know, connect dancing and coding together. So I happened to learn a bit of hip hop. <laughs> Though I worked on other dance forms before like classical Indian dance or maybe uh, Western dance, uh, like, you know, a little bit of <laughs> moving from here to there. But this was a way to learn hip hop and then a bit of scratching in the real sense, if you see on the left side picture, like, you know, connecting uh, music composition bits with programming and rhythmically, you know, generating your um, you know, simulations of your self dancing in the computer screen. Uh, some of the kids I found who were not so interested in programming, they enjoyed thoroughly after doing this project when I implemented it back in the kid museum. Um, then I went to scratch conferences uh, to kind of learn um, in uh, Cambridge, like, uh, you know, um, uh, what they have to offer about scratch. What is it that I know? What is it that I have to learn more from others? other, you know, uh, educated people in the same area. Mm, so that's how I brought back knowledge uh, as much as I could and try to implement it back in Kid Museum. Uh, again, as I was talking about US and the way they appreciate people, um, they, uh, my organization, the, uh, the reason I put their name Legal and General America is uh, the AVP of my organization, they were very uh, helpful and, you know, uh, very cooperative. They saw me doing the community work. So they nominated me for Chairman's Community Award and sent me to London uh, in this category of inspiring young people. So there, there I happened to meet a lot of, you know, social workers from different parts of Europe, Canada, US, China and other parts of the world uh, who were also doing, you know, great work in their area. Some were helping aged people, you know, some were doing foster care, some were helping with other creative work uh, or maybe just fundraising, you know, walking along the wall of China or something like that. So we happened to exchange some thoughts and ideas and knowledge. And I talked about the work we were doing in making and with scratch and creative coding and, you know, um, multidisciplinary studies, you know, uh, kind of interconnected and how we are trying to uh, bring education uh, to children's life in an interesting way. So these were the ways to kind of exchange thoughts and understand and learn more from people. Then eventually before I left US uh, in 2017, I thought I should do something for these wonderful people. And um, I happened to have an idea that, okay, there was no scratch it in the DC area. So I connected with me and the Scratch Foundation, Kid Museum and Harvard Graduate School of Education. Uh, so there was Willa and there was Karen Brennan who helped, you know, set up a scratch it meetup in the DC area. And it was based in Kid Museum. Uh, I don't know how far it's going now, but at least when it started, it went to be a um, huge success. And through this, uh, a lot of collaboration started eventually between Kid Museum and, um, you know, um, 
Harvard University and MIT. So now I hear like stories where that they are talking to each other, learning about making and science and new things. So that's pretty much end of the story in US. And then I, again, as I said, my visa ran out. <laughs> my wonderful organization, LGA, tried to sponsor my visa twice, but failed because it was a lottery system and I didn't get picked up. <laughs> and uh, it was a very short time for me to move into higher studies or something else that I really wanted to do. Uh, so I went back to India and I thought I should do something there as well. And uh, we applied for a residence in Canada because as I told you, many of the people from my state are moving elsewhere because of opportunities. And even if I had stayed in India, I would not be able to stay in my hometown forever. So we had to take a decision to move here. Um, and in India, when I went back, I, I thought, okay, what can I do? What can I do for the people? Uh, so I had some time in hand. So uh, first thing I did was I attended the LCL course that gave me some insights and knowledge about the, um, what's going on again in creative learning around the world. And then um, I did some survey um, uh, going door to door and also visiting my relatives, friends, cousins, their kids and telling them about Scratch, about how Scratch works. So there was a diverse background. Some of them were really lonely kids. It's very unfortunate because not everyone has a sibling. Mm, so they, uh, they they fell in love with Scratch <laughs> and they and then I was noting down their reactions, their observations and uh, I did it in Kolkata, I did it in Pune. As you can see, as compared to Kolkata or Bengal, in Pune there are lots of, uh, see there are advanced shops, uh, there are even Lego shops. So my nephew, he's kind of playing around with the toys and trying to build some structure on his own mm, while he's also keeping himself busy in drawing and other activities. So um, this gave me a, a, an insight once again in a, with a fresh new mind that how things are going on in India and what else could be done. Uh, I think I, I was quite, you know, um, going in a speed. If any of you have any questions, uh, please feel free to stop me. Otherwise, I will give you some time slot at the end to talk more and more. Is, is everything good so far or like, you yes, know? Yes, it's super. Okay, thank you. Mm, okay, and uh, and don't worry about the notes. I will share all these slides later on. And also I think Hello is taking a note of it. So, okay, uh, now coming to the next part. Um, sorry, can you see the slides now? Yes. Okay, great. So let me move over to the next one. So this was the small uh, presentation I did in a, uh, as a poster uh, in Scratch uh, conference in 2018. Um, that was a way for me to, you know, present the work that I did in India um, and later continued a little bit in Canada. Um, and I'm thinking of uh, developing it more uh, when I get time. In 2018, uh, when I moved to Canada, um, the first place I visited was British Columbia in 2018. This time around, I thought that um, in US, I was always balancing between two jobs. In India, I was balancing between two jobs. Here, I will take a break and see what I can do. But in a new country, you know, taking that much big risk is sometimes difficult because you also have to support your family and yourself. So for a while I worked um, with uh, autistic kids uh, because um, there, um, in, there was a consulting firm called Bridge Kids. Uh, what happens in Canada is unlike in US. Um... Hi, Veronica, can you, did you lose connection? I'm waiting for you. I noticed as, um, of course, I respect that too. Like in any proper schools, um, I try to gather information. Like if I have to teach in schools or colleges, what do I have to do? First thing is obviously I have to have an education system. I, I mean, some masters or PhD here in the um, Canada so that they can recognize my work and allow me to teach. Uh, but till then I wanted to gather some experience. So, and I wanted to work hands-on with children and see how I could extend my previous knowledge. So in this Bridge Kids Behavior Consulting Forum, though it was more like a, you can see a kind of um, 
uh, attending kids through behavior intervention, which is more psychological. But I try to uh, empower kids by also introducing creative learning and scratch programming language. Because one thing I noticed is sometimes autistic kids, they may not be able to communicate enough, but they have uh, advanced uh, learning capabilities. They have lots of innovative structure in the mind that we are probably unable to read. So when they were given a tool like Scratch they uh, and were asked to build stories, they were super fast. I mean, in no time, they picked it up, started building stories, their own composition um, communicated well. And um, not only Scratch, but I tried to experiment seeing what their interests are. Some of them were good in music. They were good in beats and understanding rhythm. So in different ways, I tried to uh, see how they are reacting, how they are learning it. So that was quite a success because the two kids that I mm, took care of in depth, apart from others, I found a significant improvement over time. And that was a really a big you know, mm, point of satisfaction for me and for the authority there. Then uh, I got a job in, um, as I told you, I have to still keep working. So I got a job in Edmonton and moved here. Uh, here it's very cold. It's very cold, like in half of the year, it's all covered with snow. <laughs> and I was not used to this much cold before. People don't go out that much. But in the summer, it's pretty nice. Uh, so I tried to um, start with a scratch day here, but uh, somehow it didn't work that well. Uh, but again, uh, one good opportunity presented itself. Um, so MIT Media Lab offered me an opportunity to, you know, collaborate with them and work on cre learning, creative learning, uh, community moderation and course facilitation. Through that, I again got connected to a lot of wonderful people from around the world. And right now I'm trying to see how online we can, you know, spread the word of education, exchange thoughts and ideas and implement things in the real life as possibly we can. And not necessarily in education itself, but in other parts and areas of you know, applications, if possible. These are two mini projects I just tried to give. Here is one about embroidery that worked on uh, in one of the creative <laughs> learning weeks. And this was uh, to give a small note from Lily. Uh, she is studying in MIT. Uh, what she mentioned is uh, the kind of work we did and she wanted to thank us for that. This were the other participants like Veronica was there. She did an excellent job with translations. Um, there were uh, Paco and there were Saskia. Mm, uh, there was, um, yeah, mm, I see a lot. Beatrice was probably there as well. Yeah, a lot of people that you may know of. Uh, they worked on brainstorming ideas and uh, encouraging discussions, you know, helping with the community, learning about new topics and things like that. So now, uh, I hopefully covered it in time, but I'm going to go directly to the questions and answers that you have. But before we do more interactions, I want to do a, a small presentation of the survey that I did based on Adele's question and Heloisa's question, like how is it like you know, learning in India and in Canada? So these are some of the survey results that I did recently. Um, what I learned from directly talking to the students in Canada is, uh, so uh, one thing I studied on a side was, in Canada, education system is definitely a plus, a very good thing. In British Columbia, Alberta, then Ontario, these are the states a little ahead of others uh, in terms of um, students' performances, quality of education. Uh, and I directly happened to talk to some of the students who are studying in these, in these areas and schools. So students, uh, what they are having to say is, um, when I took the survey, they said, I asked them the question, Adele's question, like, uh, do you have computers or computer science in school before you go to universities? Uh, then they replied, uh, one girl said it's compulsory. Uh, sorry, it's not compulsory. Like it's an elective subject that people may or may not have. Some of them said they do not have computers at all in school. Uh, in some of the parts of Canada, they don't even have a middle school. So they directly go from elementary to high school. Uh, in some parts, like in British Columbia, when they, where they, had, they had middle schools and high school, they said like, okay, computer science was a subject. And one of the students attended it. And I asked the student like, 
what did you learn? Uh, I mean, how was it? Was there any programming languages introduced? So they mentioned like they studied something in high school called um, video editing, you know, how to do basic things in computers, uh, deal with a lot of app, app, apps and apparatus, and then how to design websites using HTML, CSS, these programming languages. They enjoyed it, even though the student was from other backgrounds like they loved music or arts but they enjoyed coding i talked about them and i told them like do what is the strength of boys in the class what is the strength of the girls in the class do you think like girls enjoy coding uh, she said yes obviously i love it and then she said that her sibling she's studying computer science in ubc in masters and phd mm, so they are happily pursuing computer science in future studies um, I asked them, what do you do when you get stuck? So they said, like, we have supporting materials online. So both students and teachers, they try to browse them and learn from those, you know, free um, study materials available online. So that was one of the survey. Then I talked to parents. I talked to my colleagues and asked them, like, how about your kids? So they, most of them had kids in elementary school level. They told me they are introduced to language such as Scratch, so they know about it. And they also have other elective subjects, computer, other than computers. So it depends on who wishes to pursue what. Accordingly, they are, you know, encouraged to carry out in that language or in that particular subject. So these are the happy faces. If you see, these are the smiling faces because these are the positives that I happen to note. Uh, I didn't want to put it on slide, but just for your knowledge, uh, purely in terms of survey results, what I got, these are the negatives that I received in Canada. They said, some of them said, honestly, the students told me that they have a lot of pressure. Why? Because everybody has to perform well. It's grade-based system. Some of them complain like not all teachers are unfortunately that well equipped or that well knowledgeable. Uh, so some of them take care of kids, some of them do not, and there will be preferences and differences definitely. Uh, they talked about unequal funding. What they said is a lot of government funding goes towards uh, science and technology and those uh, subjects, while arts, music, other things are given less priorities compared to that. So not enough funding. So even though they select as electives, there is a little trouble there. And I still don't know what that in details is. So I have to learn more from them or myself if I experience. Uh, there are lack of computers in some schools. As I told you, not enough places have computers. Uh, mental health was an issue that I that was something very strange to me but one uh, one or two students said like sometimes due to tremendous pressure of performing well uh, students tend to suffer from mental health and good that it's a developed country so things are diagnosed and they are treated at the right time uh, I also interviewed one of the public school teacher as I was talking about she um, moved from India to Canada. So she was teaching in India and now she's teaching in Canada for five years in a public school. Uh, so hello, sir, this comes back to your question. Uh, if you see the highlights and I will definitely give you the snapshots and you can get the details, so no worries. Uh, she said that when I moved to Canada from India, I left behind not only my family, friends, but a very thoroughly satisfying teaching career. And one of the things when I personally asked her, she said what she missed was the enormous amount of respect coming from students, <laughs> which maybe depends on the culture a little bit, but she's adapting to it. Other things are like in, um, she's uh, in her third, uh, so if you see here in my third year as a public school teacher, I'm still learning. She mentioned about <clears throat> uh, some of the striking differences like uh, the popularity of public education here. And that's something I found too, like a lot of people give importance to public education, public schools are very good here in US and Canada. However, she said like, and opposed to what she faced in the home country where it was private schooling, okay, in India. Mm, of course, that's true. I know that. So the classrooms and the students, she said that here, it's technologically more efficient. Definitely. That's a good point. So it makes work easy for the teachers. Right. Mm, however, she made a nice comparison that there is a traditional teacher directed instruction in India, while here it's an in inquiry based learning. 
and I hope you can understand that better because I think what she meant is probably inquiry based activity based learning more hands on stuff maybe things like that is what she meant she also talked about fnmi history i'm not very sure about it i have to learn it more and she she enjoys like learning so she is into it all right so stop me whenever you want to <laughs> otherwise i'll move to the next slide so now coming back to india I talked to, because as I told you, I'm not very much in touch with the studies directly in India right now, but I happen to have a lot of connections and I'm collaborating with a few people in India. So that's how I got to know um, through survey, like what they have to say about education there. Computer science and programming is introduced in some of the primary and high schools these days across the country, but not all. So as I told you, like I was the one who went to engineering school and directly started to learn programming there while my friends they happen to learn it from school itself most of the schools across the country are unable are unable to provide adequate infrastructure for children to learn computers or technology in general making is recently being introduced in some schools as in pune bangalore etc and as i told you like the western part of india is a little ahead uh, because mainly of the political reasons that it's <clears throat> the administration actually is in support of progress so that's a good point programming languages taught in some of the schools are c c plus plus these are the fundamental languages basic if you know it it's a very ancient language it's it's still taught pascal then python in some places javascript etc <clears throat> so in western parts of india as i mentioned uh, bangalore hyderabad pune mumbai there uh, slowly and gradually uh, activity based learning is being given importance to modern teaching techniques are being introduced and implementation of digital technology uh, as compared to traditional methods of learning. Um, there are good things happening, like when I was talking to a, a person uh, I was recently collaborating with, she said that a lot of awareness was not there initially, uh, say about basic human rights, about girls' position in a society, how they are supposed to be treated and all that. But nowadays, those kinds of learning sessions are being implemented in schools so that people have a general knowledge about what to know what is good and what is bad what is right what is wrong so because from the state where i belong to uh, girls are pretty progressive and a lot of good things happen there but in other parts still they are developing and you know things are going towards better still stages eventually so that's a good thing uh, again, some of the things that people mentioned they didn't like was uh, competitive and grade based learning, traditional still in some places. Teachers and their pay scale, which is a very important, uh, a very interesting part I found. That was there a long time ago and still now is there. So, <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> so, teachers, uh, as I realized, sometimes they don't, they are not paid well enough as compared to other professions. Uh, probably that's one of the reason many um, good students, even from school, they happen to move elsewhere, you know, in other professions, unless they genuinely want to contribute in education. So that's a, um, a very sad thing, but we hope we can do something in that area. Lack of computers in some schools, as I meant, mentioned. Political interference in some states, which is really getting worse. Um, quality of education at primary school level, as some of the educators told me, that the quality of education, basic knowledge has somehow um, not been up to the mark in the primary school, which is supposed to be, uh, because unless their math and their science and their basic concepts about every subject is cleared from childhood, uh, the foundation not being strong, they will not be able to make enough advancement. So that's important. Um, however, that was one of the limitations somebody pointed. 
limited number of electives. So as I told you, like I had two options, <laughs> either science or commerce or arts. And in commerce would deal with business administration, arts, I had to study either history or geography. And then in science, I had to study either biology or statistics and computer. So uh, maybe suppose if I wanted to study, I'm just giving a random example. Uh, something with geology and something with other combinations or psychology or something. Um, yeah, things are growing now, but back then in the board examinations, we had limited options. So I never thought I could continue to, you know, be a very good uh, music artist or something in future, even if I wanted to. Mm. There are definitely ways, but there's a lot of struggle. This is uh, another survey I did uh, from Professor Kundu, um, and I just brought the points if you want to take a note. Uh, he again mentioned the quality of government sponsored schools. So this is about university. So far we were talking about schools and this last slide is on university. Mm, so the quality of government sponsored schools have deteriorated. That's about again about Bengal, West Bengal that he's talking about my hometown. The good thing is they have introduced computer nowadays, but infrastructure is not adequate everywhere. Private schools are better off in that sense. Again, the students are not getting enough time for grooming themselves. They're feeling a constant pressure to complete homeworks, private tuition, private computer classes, etc., which is a growing concern these days. As a human being, students need to improve as well. Above all, too much political interference in some of the school level, university level. Uh, so there are lots of reputed universities and let, let me tell you something, a lot of Nobel laureates happened to come from West Bengal. Uh, there was a golden age, there was a period of Renaissance where uh, people were good in literature like Rabindranath Tagore was born there. Um, Amartya Shen, the economist who uh, was a Nobel laureate again was from Kolkata, Bengal. Uh, there was Shatyajit Ray, the movie director who won Oscar for doing films exceptionally well. He was from Kolkata. There was a religious leader, Swami Vivekananda from Kolkata. A lot of good scientists were there in Kolkata and Bengal, but uh, the same universities like Presidency, like Jadavpur, like good colleges are not being able to keep up to the level it was before because of a lot of political intervention, unfortunately. Though IITs, like the Indian Institute of Technologies, they are still uh, performing pretty well. And some of the best of the best students are still learning there. So that's pretty much the whole story. And again, this professor mentioned about pay package again, which kinds of work as a hindrance and reason for people to move out of this profession. Thank you for listening to this so-called long lecture. I don't know how far I covered, but I tried my best to put things together for you. And if there is any question, please feel free to ask. And I can also learn from you if, if something you want to correct in this whole process, because I'm just starting to work Thank here. You, uh, now uh, we're going to start. I believe that we have a lot of questions. So, Adele, <laughs> you can start it, please. Thank you, Mohana, for ordering this uh, presentation. It was really, really interesting to see uh, your journey uh, from India to US, come back to India, Canada, to see uh, that you really love uh, teaching and I really loved uh, your, all your uh, path. Uh, I have a lot of questions about uh, but that's fine. I mean, you answered already one question about uh, the, the education uh, in Canada and uh, in, uh, in India. So what I see here, for example, in Canada and even in India, in a high school level, there is a lot uh, to think in middle school and high school level. I think there is a lot of, uh, 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 of things uh, to do to bring computer science in every curriculum. I was expecting, for example, in Canada, that the situation will be like more uh, better, uh, that everybody will be studying computer science, but it seems no. I mean, uh, uh, what do you think about this? So that's a very good question. And um, honestly, I will admit it, I'm very new in Canada. I just came in 2018, this is 2019, and I'm still not into the education system, the academic field uh, in that depth to know enough. 
However, um, I just, because you raised that point one week ago or two weeks ago, I just happened to take, uh, you know, notes from some of the websites, some of the people that I happened to talk to. And these were uh, survey results based on students' opinion and mm -hmm. one or two teachers and also some of the parents who were helping their children learn in elementary and middle schools. Um, one thing I noticed is, um, I also uh, thought that way, like Canada would be definitely great in studies. And you know what, uh, maybe I am wrong. Maybe uh, in a lot of universities and a lot of schools, colleges, a lot of things are introduced that I'm not aware of. I have to do more uh, detailed study and research on that to learn better. Uh, for example, I stayed in the university campus, University of British Columbia uh, for two weeks and I, uh, I try to learn from the students and the professors there. There are lots of great research work going on in different fields in computer science. And when we talk about universities, computer science has a lot of applications, right? Not just only in the industry about artificial intelligence or machine learning or, you know, uh, implementing things in data science and other areas, but there are also not only just automation and robotics, but there are different applications. I'll just give you an example, like the research going on, suppose, and uh, people suffer, suffering from PTSD. So for them, how can computer help? How can coding help? How can different uh, science uh, applications help? There are lots of researchers in different fields. And one of the great things that I, that I so these are people's opinion that I accumulated together. If you take my viewpoint as a newcomer in this country, what I faced is, suppose I'm just giving an, a very simple example. If I go to the hospital, or if I go to a public place, uh, some kind of records that we are happening to collect that is directly going to the university so that students can do more research on that. I uh, collaborated with a few people in connection with weaving. So there was a group of indigenous people from Canada who were uh, trying to share the knowledge of weaving uh, and arts with other people. So in that connection, I connected myself to a few students from UBC who were actively helping in volunteering activities in the society to learn the situation better and go back to university and apply it in their research and in their work. So the university level studies are like excellent. Like when I went there, I attended a talk of hmm, Dr. I think Rosalind Picardo or what's her name? Mm, yeah, she's from MIT. She talked about, um, I was interested in psychology and in you know computer science, how things are working. There was an excellent presentation from her about what's going on with um, ASD affected kids, what's going on with mental health, what's going on with education, with uh, programming and all these you know, different research areas. So what I see is a lot of collaboration, like recently, uh, uh, if you know Yumiko, she is coming, she, is, she has joined, I think, Simon Fraser University. She's working with a lot of people in, in Vancouver. Uh, a lot of great collaborations work in the university level, even in Alberta, like University of Alberta is a good place to study. There are lots of good universities and professors. In school level, um, that is one of the very protected areas that all the developed countries thoroughly, uh, you know, keep uh, within the teachers and the educators who are actually on board. So unless I interview the people who are working there, I don't get to know enough. Uh, so I, my knowledge is mostly superficial based on, that's why I just mentioned it's a survey result and I cannot 100% rely on their comments because it's just an opinion. So uh, unless you are into it, you don't know enough. Uh, but I think uh, they are also putting a lot of effort in making and science and technology. One of the good things I found here in Canada is some of the students told me they give importance to behavior alongside studies. So they, they mentioned it in elementary level in a very good depth that you have to be a good human being first and then do well in studies. So that's something new and interesting I found in terms of value and ethics. However, 
in in a contrary other parts of canada they said that no the the level according to them is going down everybody has an opinion but uh, i have to bring more facts and uh, you know figures to establish what's true uh, there are good and bad sides of everything um, both in the east and in the west and i think the best way to learn is through collaboration and through understanding what's better Mm, and I think university level study is uh, tremendous here, so uh, nothing against that at all. But uh, for schools, I'm still to learn more. All right, thank oh. you so much. Okay, anybody else? Uh, we have Roberto, me. Me, would you like to ask something? Mm. No, I don't think so. I just really appreciate what you shared, Mohana. Um, and I know like I knew you during your uh, your time in Maryland, but it's still great to hear like more context around the actual work that you are doing um, day to day. So yeah, I really appreciate it. Um, I also thought uh, the points that you made about just the survey you conducted at the end were really interesting. Um, and the point that one of the students made about um, mental health, because I think that's something that we're beginning to see a lot more in United States education too, that there's a vocabulary for maybe the pressures that students feel um, and the ability to share that with teachers or parents. So um, yeah, was, that's interesting. Thank you. Thanks me for coming here. Uh, you brought a very good point. I wanted to tell something beyond this, uh, just in connection with mental health. Uh, one of the good things I, one of the things I just learned from a lot of uh, friends, peers, and you know, co-workers is that um, I'm not telling I'm like you know, maybe 50 years ago, even in 10, 12 years ago when we were in school colleges um, or universities, um, we. Uh, so there are good and bad side of everything, right? Like science is growing like enormously, but now the gadgets, um, they are good, like giving a lot of information. Sometimes the information is too much. Like kids are diving into it all the time. Maybe they are busy browsing the, you know, cell phone all the time from morning. Some of the parents are careful that they don't have enough screen time, but sometimes they are just busy uh, browsing it. This is good in some way, like they can Google and learn more stuff, come back to school and challenge the teachers and say, hey, I, you know what, I learned this from that source. Uh, what you were saying, can you please repeat or can you please verify? That's good, but also sometimes um, the outdoor activities, the playing, the interaction with others, you know, those things I find somehow is missing in the society. Uh, also, not enough kids. That's wh why I started building that poster mm. where I found like, you know, some of them do not have siblings or somebody at home to share their views. Uh, that makes people a little isolated as compared to before. And yeah, and along with that, the pressure for performance is kind of bothering them sometimes. Yes, about the mental health, there's a lot of more other questions that I work with too. Maybe we can, could discuss because it's, it's a lot of questions, a lot of things that's going on. And this is a very uh, interesting issue and very serious question that we have to deal with because it has these problems, health problems, have uh, raised about 200% per in the world. So it's a general problem and a lot of other questions besides the curriculum is involved. So it's a very good question. We should make another session just to discuss this, maybe. Sure. Yes. And we would love to hear from you, Heloisa, because you are pretty expert in that field. You have done so much in you know, neuroscience, psychology, and all those things. I think we'll be love to learn that from you. Yes, it, this is a very serious problem, really. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Roberto, would you like to ask something or comment? Any yeah, comments? Yeah. Please. Thank you, thank you, Mona. Thank you, Mona, for this very uh, interesting uh, presentation. My question is, uh, as you know, I'm a teacher and I teach mathematics and in my schools, uh, computer science is not a uh, official subject. 
and unfortunately it is not a subject at all and so my question is how would you suggest to introduce computer science uh, in um, in schools where it is not mandatory or where it is even not allowed as a, a subject per se uh, one of the good uh, i can share a small little experience of mine if that helps uh, so i went to um, a place called sos village uh, if you have heard of it's a NGO run place where a lot of yes. um, you know, kids, yeah, they are together, um, brought up in a society. So I just met the director, okay? Um, it was last year. I met the director and I talked to him or and the group for a while and I tried to, uh, I carried a laptop with me. Um, I opened Scratch <laughs> and I told him like, uh, do you have a minute and uh, would you like to see something? Uh, you know what, uh, I just want to give a free session, a demonstration of this wonderful tool and want to see how kids react to it. Because, uh, you know, if we give them an opportunity to build stories, just like they are doing storytelling at in classes, suppose, talking to each other, if they happen to learn something from this, I will be very happy to serve. And then uh, they found it like the tool is so powerful itself. I didn't have to talk much. Uh, so with a few demonstration of projects, they could understand, okay, this is a wonderful platform. Some of them took it in a way that, okay, they are going to learn something similar to a programming language in a small scale. Uh, some of them thought like, okay, this would be a wonderful platform for interaction or for um, building stories, um, expressing their thoughts and ideas. Uh, some of them thought maybe it was an entertainment. In whichever way they thought, they uh, tried to accept it. And the response was overwhelming. And uh, so it was in Kolkata again. So um, I just took one or two sessions with the kids and kids just jumped into it. They wanted to learn more, have more sessions. So then I grouped the class into different uh, groups. Like I asked the question to kids, like, what do you like? because it's interesting it's important to know what they like some of them loved math some of them loved music so you know i divided into groups for the ones who loved say dance i showed them a project with hip-hop and scratch uh, to the one who loved music i did a small recording of their own voice or their own songs whatever they loved to sing and then i showed them how the cat is singing in their voice then uh, there was a kid who was interested in math. I tried to um, bring small, small puzzles in front of them and show them how to work in Scratch. So that was the starting point to allow them to connect to computer and programming and make a basic start. After they grow some interest, they want to learn more. They can, you can introduce them to processing. That's a good programming language. You can introduce them to Python or JavaScript. Uh, and slowly and gradually you can advance. And because you are a mathematics professor, so it would be very interesting for you to draw a connection because, com because computational thinking is to some extent definitely logical. Uh, I'm not talking about binaries of zeros and ones, but definitely it has a rational thought in it. So if you break it into pieces of steps and try to draw you know, connection with math, that would be wonderful, I think. Uh, so suppose a simple mathematical logic, if this, then what would you do? If else, then what would you do? So let's give them a puzzle and let them show the way. Okay, if you want to do this, let the character move from this to that place and do this activity. If not, let's do another set of code for it. And let's uh, connect the blocks and pieces and make bigger programs, make a bigger flow of flowchart and things like that. Do you know anybody who's actually conducting research um, between the connection uh, um, about the connection between computational thinking and mathematical thinking, like uh, problem solving and mathematics subjects? Because you know, math teaching mathematics is very strict in a sense. You have to teach some uh, topics. You have to go through. And so uh, I'm, I'm interested in understanding if you can uh, connect the two, the two uh, areas, which are very, okay. very, uh, of course they're very connected, but 
Uh, I'd like to know yeah. more on that. How? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I will keep a note of it. And um, if not now, I will see how best I can either provide you resources or the right person who might be able to help you in that context. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, and I will take your email ID from Heloisa after this. Okay. Um... We have a lot of people here today, and maybe we have more questions from others. Would you like to, to ask or comment something? Make any comments? Anders. Yeah, sorry, sorry, I, I didn't hear. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, you, you can hear me? Yes, that's okay. I'm, I'm sitting outside. Uh, the, Maybe the last day sitting outside. Because Twelve it's degrees getting, in Sweden is very hot today. Yes, it? It, it's getting cold. <laughs> it's getting colder. Yeah. Uh, uh, first, uh, the presentation, I just love it. Thank you. Uh, it, it's so 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 nice to to be in India and thinking about Indian kids, and then you're moving to to uh, US and then you go on to Canada. So I, I think Canada, when you're speaking about Canada, it's a little bit like Sweden, I think. Uh, in the climate, it's uh, like Sweden and the educational system is more like Sweden too, I think. And the, the, one of the, the in the slides, mental health. I think it's a huge problem internationally. Uh, you you know the, the the cell phone. In Sweden, they started a, a new law that uh, teacher could uh, take this uh, tele, uh, the mobile uh, when they enter in the classroom. They could take it, and no no one have the, this in in the classroom. So I, I don't know what is happening. It's international. Something is happening. I don't know what. That's not a question, but maybe it's a reflection. Yeah. Um, yeah, everybody will have a thought around it. I think sometimes people tend to forget the simple, simple things in life that make them happy and uh, they're idolizing big figures most of the kids like mark zuckerberg or bill gates or somebody everybody wants to be a pioneer in a field of say computer or something else but they are forgetting what is within them if they think deep diving within themselves they might end up finding something new and interesting so i think uh, spending quality time with the people you love and you know always trying to work it out that that's how probably it helps but mm. um, yeah a lot of you know there are better people here to tell give that answer here. so we we'll look forward to those sessions going forward mm. another thing i find is maybe facebook people are of this new generation they are busy sometimes in no, you know, comparing like what are others doing, what are they doing, where do they stand in the society, and that that's kind of building a pressure too at some point of time. Mm. Okay. I think they 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 were a little bit. Uh, they they told they made a survey with kids, and they actually know that the cell phone is uh, taking up so much time they don't have time to other things so maybe the kids themselves are getting into okay this is not so good maybe i just put it away one hour maybe i don't know <laughs> i hope so Yes, this is a very serious problem. There's a lot of research around the world about these issues. A recent paper that I have uh, read uh, tells some astonishing results. Uh, they say that um, 
they compare just the time the kids or people in general, namely the younger people use cell phone, only cell phone, not all, in, uh, including computers and other stuff, just with cell phone. After two hours, they have 30% of risk of mental uh, problems related to depression and suicide two hours a day. After five, five hours a day, it's 70% of the risk of having mouth problems, health problems uh, related to depression and suicide. It's a very serious problem. I have been working a lot with my students and because they are just uh, it's a vicious, so a vicious thing. So I ask mm. them, I used to ask them, why do you have your cell phone here? Why do you have to have it? Let's try to put it one hour, as you told, one hour out. Keep it on your back. Here, you don't use it. And then they say, oh, they gave me the feedback. Oh, it helped me a lot to concentrate, to do my homework, to study. And yes, it's strange. I don't know why I keep it here. So it's try try this with the, the kids. It's <laughs> it's very impressive. And by the other side, not only the kids, uh, we see that the parents are not uh, emotionally available. I can see in the park uh, young mothers with their babies in the. Yeah, strollers or things like that and like this they push in the, the stroller and but they are not paying attention to the kids so it's crazy hi <laughs> what's happening so it's a very serious problem and i'm glad to, to know that in sweden it's prohibited now <laughs> it's it's a very strange stuff so <laughs> this is a very serious problem indeed so coming back to the mathematics and computer science, um, are you you you're sharing this, Mohana? Source for understanding, you know, Robert's question, like how you can connect computational thinking with, uh, you know mathematics uh, so yeah i will check this out too i didn't know about it before and if there are any other resources that i can possibly share maybe i will share after this thank you me it was wonderful having you here i just couldn't believe this thanks to helis as well oh, thanks for having me it's great okay i think we are finished by now because for sure, we have a lot of questions and things to share and exchange. I'd like to thank you very much, Mohana, for your wonderful presentation. It's my pleasure. Uh, just wonderful, a lot of information that we have to process yet. And for sure, we have a lot of things to, to ask later and exchange mm -hmm. we st we still in touch sure. and mm -hmm. and i like to to thank you to everybody here Beers, uh especially for you mohona for your wonderful presentation uh welcome am i for our group and you are super welcome for the next one as uh, when you are available and thank you for everybody's friends for Join us today, sharing and making this uh, session very, very worthy. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure and honor. Thank you, everybody, for patiently listening. And I don't know how far I could help, but I just tried my best. It's wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Bye. Bye bye.